Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Acts. We come today to Acts chapter 17. We left off last time in verse 4, so we'll pick it up right there. In Acts chapter 17, it would be good if you can get your Bible so that you can read the scriptures with me as we study it verse by verse today. And speaking of that, you can study the Bible verse by verse anytime you want to with me. Three complete series going through the Bible at thebibleversebyverse.com. And you can do it at your pace, at your convenience, and all you need to bring is your Bible. Everything else is there. Just click and listen. Again, that is at thebibleversebyverse.com. <clears throat> okay. Well, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. And I think we will begin reading in chapter 17 of Acts, verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Ampilius and Apollyana, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief priests, or of the chief women, I should say, not a few. So, wide range of people turning to Christ because of the Word of God being taught clearly by Paul. <clears throat> and some of them were even the sworn enemies of Jesus, the priests. So the Word of God was doing its work because Paul was doing his work, which was clearly teaching it, no matter who liked it or who did not like it. <clears throat> Verse 5. But the Jews who believed who believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain vile fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. The Jewish leaders, following their usual ways, were jealous of Paul and Silas because some of their religion became Christians. They walked away from Judaism and they became Christians. Consequently, they incited some useless troublemakers off the street to form a mob and go after Paul and Silas. That has always been the devil's way. That is what the Nazis did to terrorize the people of Germany into voting for the Nazi party. Intimidation, extortion, and the same thing is going on today. When you have a political party that does not condemn anarchists and rioters, well then they're on their side. And we see that in the streets of America, where when they don't like something that happens, they turn the city upside down. They burn buildings. They destroy businesses. They kill people. That's the devil's way. It's a way of intimidating. And if you don't follow us, if you don't put into office who we want to want to have in office, then we're gonna we're gonna destroy your cities. And you know what? There comes a time when you have to fight the devil. And it does take fight. It does take a fight. The, Satan doesn't like to have his toes stepped on. So yes, he's going to get angry. 
but you don't back off and cower in front of them. You take the fight to them and you continue to do what is right. And so we see that happening right here. Jesus and the apostles are making headway into the kingdom of darkness. Does Satan like that? No, no. So he instigates a riot. And to try to turn the people away from Christianity and Jesus and the apostles. You think that's going to stop Paul from preaching the word of God? Not in your life. You preach the word of God. You do what is right. You fight for what is right. And you take whatever lumps come your way. But you don't level, let the devil intimidate you into compromise or into doing that which is wrong. Devil gets angry when people follow Christ. And he stirs up trouble for those who preach the word that makes it happen. Verse 6. And when they found them, found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come here also. Actually, they got it wrong because the world is already upside down. The world is upside down. The unsaved world and the world system that excludes God, it is upside down. It's all messed up because of sin. Nothing operates the way it should. There's confusion. There's sin. There's jealousy. There's murder. There's killing. There's envy. There's strife. The world is upside down because of sin. The word of God in Jesus Christ sets the world right side up. So they had a completely opposite of the way it really was. The problem is people are so used to doing things the wrong way and thinking about things the wrong way that they get thrown for a loop when the right way comes along. Seven. Whom Jason hath received... And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. They imply that the apostles are plotting against Rome and against Caesar. They'll say whatever they have to say to turn the people against them. They don't mind lying. And that certainly was a lie. Because Christianity is not about politics. Christianity is about preaching salvation through Jesus Christ. It is about holiness. Jesus never told his people to overthrow the government. Never. If anything, he said, submit to the government. Submit to the government and the laws of the land until such a time as they command you to do something that's contrary to Scripture. Verse 8. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city, when they heard these things, the people were fine with Christianity until the jealous Jews stirred up trouble with their lies. See, nothing changes, does it? A few troublemakers can make life miserable for a lot of people. Verse 9. And when they had taken security of Jason... And of the others, they let them go. The, the man, Jason, had to post bail before the disciples would be released. Verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming there, went into the synagogue of the Jews. Trouble, as we see here, did not dampen Paul's enthusiasm for Jesus Christ or the word of God. You don't want Jesus here? Fine. <clears throat> I'm not going to try to force him down your throat. We just move on to a different place. Preach the same message. Trouble did not dampen Paul's spirit. Trouble did not dampen the apostles' enthusiasm for the word of God. He just kept preaching the Bible. He established the church in Thessalonica and suffered for it. But then he moved on to another place called Berea, and he's going to do the exact same thing there, knowing full well that there may be the exact same results. 
11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scripture daily whether those things were so. The Bereans were more noble, according to God. God said it. They were more noble. You know why? It's because they examined Paul's words by scripture. They examined his words by scripture. And they are said to be noble because of that. That is a noble thing to do. Do not accept or reject anything someone says on the basis of who they are, their reputation, or how you feel. Even the apostles' words had to square with Scripture. Nobody can, nobody can uh, bypass that. Verse 12, Therefore, Many of them believed, also of honorable women, who were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Notice, after examining the scriptures, many of them believed. If an unbeliever will prayerfully, carefully, and sincerely examine the written word of God, God will reveal truth to them and eventually lead them to Christ. 13. And when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timothy abode still there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So Paul leaves Berea in haste and goes to Athens. And of course, he hits the ground running, as it were. As soon as he gets there, he's ready to preach the word of God. The very best scholars, the very best statesmen, and military minds were in Athens. They were a unique group. It was the top city in the area of philosophy, education, and arts. Verse 16. <clears throat> now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given over to idolatry. The city that was considered the home of wisdom and art was also spiritually blind and insane. They were drunk with idolatry and superstitions. Satan had a stronghold in Athens. It was filled with sophisticated, high-sounding spiritual nonsense. Packaged very well but still damning, as damning as any other heresy, as damning as any other false beliefs, only it was pack packaged in a sophisticated manner. 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the marketplace daily with them that met with him. You think Paul was intimidated? by the sophistication and the high-sounding arguments of the people in Athens, not in your life. He had the word of God. So he went to the marketplace, and he was teaching the word of God in the marketplace. The marketplace was sort of like the coffee shop of today. The regulars gathered in the marketplace every morning, and I suppose they solved the world problems just as what happens in many local coffee shops today. The marketplace was where the men met to talk about things and to debate issues. 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans 
and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Others, he seemed to be he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. The Epicureans were atheists. The Epicureans lived to satisfy whatever they hungered for. The Stoics were completely opposite. They believed in gods, plural. They believed in gods, even though they thought that the gods were indifferent. But the Stoics were different from the Epicureans because the Epicureans just let her snap, and the Stoics were strict. So they were the exact opposite. Verse 19. That Paul is dealing with all these people. 19. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine of which thou speakest is. Paul is not under arrest here. However, the scholars wanted to know more about this Jesus who Paul keeps talking about. Consequently, they bring Paul to what would be similar to the Supreme Court, which was called the Areopagus. And what we have here, beneath the surface, is Jesus giving Paul another opportunity to proclaim the word of God to those who otherwise would never hear it. 20. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Ah, that was... That was Athens for you. It was a unique place. They're always looking for a fresh mental or emotional buzz. They're always, they always looking for something new to consider, especially some new religious or philosophical idea. They sat around in their academic dream world and devised theories. 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive in all things that ye are superstitious. They were superstitious. In fact, they had a God for everything. And Paul will try to convince them that all their gods that they looked to, that they argued for, are nothing, worthless. And Paul will attempt to convince them that what they need is the one God and his son, Jesus Christ. 23. For as I pass by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. The idolaters in Athens knew deep down that there was a God who made everything. There is that witness, you know, in every human being that you are born with, that there is a creator God. Whoever he might be, you know he's there. And these Athenians, they knew he was there. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know who he was, but they didn't want to risk offending him, whoever he was, so they built him an altar. Verse 24. Paul continues, God, who made the world and all things in it, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, 
dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Well, that's a novel idea for the Athenians. This one true God doesn't dwell in temples? Unlike their idols, the real God is not confined to one place. Unlike their so-called gods, the real God doesn't need to be carried around by human hands. In fact, he made human hands. The real God is the highest and the final authority. 25. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Boy, Paul is explaining this one true God to these sophisticated philosophers and scholars and idolaters. And he says, God is self-sufficient. The real God doesn't need anyone from or anything from anyone. He is perfect all by himself. He can get along just fine without anyone or anything. I heard somebody say something screwy one time. The person said, you know, the reason God created man was that he was, he was lonely. <laughs> he was lonely. God was not lonely. He didn't need anyone. He didn't need companionship. God is perfect in every way, and he is perfectly satisfied with himself. He gets along just fine. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have all they need. They're all 100% God. They're all one. They're all 100% perfect and complete in every way. God wasn't lacking anything. He doesn't lack it. He doesn't lack anything. He doesn't need your worship. He doesn't need anything from you. The things that he tells us to do, what they are are opportunities for us to serve him. And we need that. And of course, he's honored by that, but he doesn't need it. God is self-sufficient. Doesn't need anyone from anything from anyone. That's what Paul is saying. Perfectly perfect all by himself. 26. Paul continues to describe this one true God that they knew was out there somewhere. That's why they built the altar to him. They just didn't know what his name was. So Paul continues to enlighten them. What about this one true God? Verse 26, And hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an announcement to make. There is only one race. It is not the white. It is not the red. It is not the yellow. It is not the brown, it is not the black. Those are irrelevant. There is only one race in man, the human race. God has made us all of one blood. We all descend from Adam and Eve. We're all related. That's the truth. Don't believe these heretics who tell you that God created all the races differently at different times. That's not true. Notice verse 26 again. And hath made of one blood all nations of men. It all started with Adam and Eve. That's what he's saying. It started with those two people. So don't go wrong carrying placards saying black lives matter and get ticked off at people who say all lives matter. If you get ticked off when someone says all lives matter, then you're the problem. And if, and if I was God, your, your life would not matter to me. You're lucky that I'm not God. Anybody who gets offended by saying all, by someone saying all lives matter has got a problem. They better get into the word of God. If all, lives, if all lives don't matter, then no lives matter because we all descend from the same parents, my friends. We're all part of the same race. You better say all lives matter or your life doesn't matter. I 
and hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God places people and nations where he wants them to be. The reason there are so many wars and so much trouble is that people and nations are not content with what God has given them. They want what belongs to others. So they try to take it. And that makes for strife. And that makes for war. It's not that complicated. 27. That they should seek the Lord, if perhaps they might feel after him and find him, though he is not far from every one of us. God is not far from every one of us, from any of us. He really isn't. He's not a distant deity. He's not confined to his throne room in heaven. The real God is everywhere. No, it's not pantheism where you have a little piece of God here with me and a little piece of God with you and a little piece of God on the moon and a little piece of God in China and a little piece of God on Mars. And when you put it all together, it, it makes up the God. No. The entire God is with you right now. The entire God is with me right now. 100% of God is with you. 100% of God is with me. That is God's omnipresence. He is everywhere. 100% of him is everywhere at the exact same time. He's not far from any of us. So think about it. As a Christian, that God is your father. And Jesus is your Savior. And with Christ, you are never far away from your protector, your provider, your physician, your guide. He is with you constantly all the time. 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. In other words, God Almighty causes us to be and causes us to continue to be. In him we live and move and have our being. If it wasn't for God, we would not be living. If it wasn't for God, we could not move, we could not function. If it wasn't for God, we would not have our being. In other words, our life would end as soon as it started. If God would ever withdraw his life from us, if God would ever withdraw his sustaining power from us, we would, we would collapse and turn to dust immediately. We cannot move a muscle apart from God's grace. We cannot think a thought apart from God's grace. We cannot take another deep, another breath, another heartbeat without the grace of God. Every little movement we make inside and out is a gift from our Creator. You best remember that. And those of you who have no regard for God and try to exclude Him from your life, you know what? One of these days you're going to find out that he's going to give you the desires of his heart, of your heart. He is going to walk away from you and you will collapse. You will die. And that God you didn't want in this life will not be with you in the next life either. So you'll go straight to hell and be punished for your sins forever and ever in the lake of fire. And I'm out of time. Continue studying with me at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. I'm not underwritten by large church or denomination, never have been. So if you want to be a part of this ministry, I ask that you would please pray for me, pray for the Word of God. Also, when you take a break from studying, click the Donate button at the top of the front page at the BibleVerseByVerse.com and prayerfully, prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. I appreciate you. Thank you for spending this time with me. Until next time, so long, everyone.